around the world. The Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Hello, friends. This is Pastor David Langford, and as always, we would like to welcome you today to this edition of The Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. We welcome you today wherever that you might be. It is my prayer, it is my heart, it is my desire that God's goodness, God's grace is touching your heart and life immensely. Amen. Well, today is December the 5th, and we welcome you today, and I trust that you had a tremendous time of thanksgiving. This now is the time of year when people are celebrating Hanukkah, some are celebrating Christmas, we just always celebrate Jesus. I'm not going to get into the arguments and the debates about Christmas. I understand every bit of that, probably more than most people listening. Jesus was born of a virgin. He was probably born in September or October. The Annunciation in Luke chapter 2 is very, very clear. Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 7, 14, and therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel being interpreted means God with us. Think of that statement, God with us. And the reason we believe it was in September or October is because of the fact that would be either the Feast of Trumpets or the Feast of Tabernacles. Feast of Tabernacles, simply when God tabernacles with man. That is going to be a reality one day when Jesus Christ returns to the earth and he will eternally abide with mankind. He will eternally be with the redeemed. And the Bible says, and God himself uh, shall tabernacle with man. Revelation 21, 3 says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. God will tabernacle with men. So that is going to be a reality. I don't know exactly when Christ will return, but I know he is coming back. And the reason I teach and I preach some of the things that I do about the Jewish feast it's because you always see a three-and-one-half-year scenario in the book of Daniel and in the book of Revelation. Bear with me just a moment today. If Luke 3.23 says that Jesus began his ministry at about the age of 30, his ministry was three-and-one-half years long, we see him t attending the Passover feast in the book of John. When you look at all of those events, and Christ, of course, being born in the fall of the year, the Great Tribulation would start in the spring of the year. Just trying to give you a little parenthetical time frame here. So if the Great Tribulation were to begin in the spring of the year, Jesus then would come in the fall of the year, three and one-half years later. A three-year circle would make it spring again, and the other half a year would bring it to the fall. Jesus Christ's ministry was three and one-half years. Therefore, being born in the fall of the year and beginning his ministry at about the age of 30, he would have been 33 years old in September or October. Then you add six months to that, put you back in the spring of the year, March or April. Therefore, his ministry was three and one-half years and he died fulfilling Passover. So all of these 
numbers, all of these events are in the scriptures. It is just up to you and I as Bible students to study, to study the scriptures and to dissect them that we might fully understand what's going on. Before we go into the scriptures today, because I'm here today to encourage you, I want to simply strengthen your hands. I want to strengthen your feeble knees. I want to strengthen your weary mind. I am here today for this program to comfort you through the Holy Scriptures, to minister to you, to strengthen you, because not only myself, but God the Father wills that you be comforted. He's a God that loves us so immensely and so powerfully. And when we are grappling and struggling, he wants us to know he's with us. He wants you to know, I'm with you, saith the Lord. You're not by yourself. You're not in this valley alone. The psalmist here in Psalms 46, verse 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, Therefore, will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah. Without a doubt, many of you listening to this broadcast today In the not-too-far-distant past, you have suffered excruciating pain. The pain has been unfathomable. It's been formidable. For some, for the most part, it's been more than you could bear. Satan has sought to wreak untold havoc in your life. Maybe those of you listening today, and there are some, you've lost a loved one. That loved one was precious and tremendously dear to your heart. Having been a minister for nearly 40 years and having preached scores of funerals, I'm always smitten and stricken profusely in my heart and in my mind with humility. As I stand among those who are suffering, grieving, weeping, and toiling because of the suffering that you have had to endure because of something that has happened to a loved one. Let me say today, don't let the devil put a guilt trip on you and make you think, make you perceive, make you feel as though somehow, some way, you are liable and you are responsible for that decedent's death. Every day, People make choices. Sometimes those choices are profoundly, profusely poor choices. Not seeing far enough to understand that what they have done or about to do or going to do, the total ramifications of just what might take place. I have had numerous men through my ministry call me and tell me they were going to commit suicide. And they would pour their hearts out to me and I listened intently. I never take a person's statement regarding suicide lightly. Some are seeking pity. Some are looking for help. 
Some are just wanting to see how you will respond if they make such a statement. But nevertheless, there is a void. There is a vacuity. There is something beneath what you and I see externally that is troubling them greatly. And everyone that's ever confided in me, I've always been able to change their minds by telling them, what will your son, what will your daughter think as they stand by the casket and they look at you as you left them, you abandoned them, you forsook them because of your selfish, self-serving, self-centered ideology. As the, as the children, whether they be adolescents, young adults, whatever the case might be, and they're weeping, And then all of a sudden, the light goes off in their minds, and they see the utter selfishness, the utter selfishness. And and, and I want to say this today, and I don't say this to be unkind. I do not say this to be ugly. I do not say this to condemn or castigate in any capacity. I'm not saying this for any of those reasons. What I'm saying is suicide is one of the greatest and most selfish acts that a person could do. Because what they don't understand, what they do not comprehend, what they fail to grasp is that they're gone. And the family is left to deal with all the brokenness and broken pieces. The God that I serve is a God of restoration, a God of healing, a God of grace, and a God of strength. Jesus told us in John 10, 10, for the thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Jesus Christ wants every one of you listening today to have an abundant life. It is Satan that comes to take that abundant life. Jesus said emphatically, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Jesus Christ wants his children to have a profusely abundant life. Satan desires the exact opposite. God wants you to have exceedingly. He wants you to have above the greatest abundance, supernaturally abundant, over and above. That that exceeds, it is Extraordinary abundance. This is what Christ wants in your spiritual life every day. I'm not going to sit here and tell you he wants you to be abundant in riches, wealth. I hear so many business people that have tremendous amounts of wherewithal money, And they say, I just want peace. I just want peace. I'm here to tell you today, the only way to have peace is in Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. There is no other way for us to have absolute peace unfathomable peace except it be in Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. You're not going to find peace in a prescription drug. You're not going to find peace in a liquor bottle. You're not going to find peace in another extramarital affair. 
It's not going to happen. Oh, I know there are those that think that's an answer. That's not an answer. Because once you gratify and you satisfy the flesh, you're still empty. There is still something missing. And that's why David said, God is our refuge. I want you to notice the inclusiveness. Not God is my refuge, but David said, God is our refuge. You and I can have the same refuge that David the psalmist had when he was facing the lion, when he was facing the bear. When he was facing Goliath, God, Elohim, was his refuge and his strength. God wants you to have him as your refuge. He wants to be that present help when you're in trouble. As I said earlier, trouble comes in many forms and in many facets and in many ways. Trouble. He's in trouble. I'm in trouble. I am troubled by what I feel. I am troubled by what I hear. I'm I'm troubled in my spirit because I sense Satan working, plotting, a ploy against my life. Every one of us knows what it means to be troubled in our spirit. I've been troubled many times about many things. Sometimes I'm troubled about relationships. Though I try to make the relationship work, though I try to overlook the quirks, differences, something in my spirit deep down says it's not going to work. You know, sometimes we get ourselves in a very difficult place because we try to make it happen. We tried to to bring to fruition what we wanted, what we will. I, I hear this so much in people desiring companionship. I know I've been there. I was 27 years old before I got married. I know what it means to be alone. I know what it means to be traveling every week as an itinerant evangelist traveling across Many, many states preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and just desirous for companionship. It was God that said, it is not good that man should be alone. It wasn't a man that said that. It was God that said that. God said that. And sometimes we, treat, we try to create a circumstance or a situation to satisfy, to gratify our flesh. Why? Because we are so adamant. We are so ardent. We are so unyielding. We want it to work this way, God. Then what you are doing is negating God's power to be your refuge. Because when God is your refuge, a refuge is to a place which one flees. It's a place where someone goes for safety. It is a place where someone goes for security, for protection, like a a a a, a cellar, a basement, a tornado. Uh, cellar, a place of protection because of the tempest, because of the storm. And you know, if you can get in that place of refuge, no matter how vehement, no matter how ferocious the storm and the tempest, you know you can endure it. And once the storm has passed, you'll be all right. 
because you were in a place of refuge. I'm not talking about physical storms. I'm talking about spiritual storms. As we get older, we all face physical anomalies and aberrations. Some have to have their knees replaced. Some need their hips replaced. All sorts of things. I'm not talking about your humanity. I'm talking about your spirituality. I'm talking about the devil as he shoots fiery darts from hell trying to invoke something upon your life that will cause you to become distraught, distressed, perplexed, finding yourself seemingly in a strait where there's no way out. This is when we believe Psalms 68.1, let God arise and our enemies be scattered. It's like a child running behind its mama and getting hold of her skirt. That child seeks the refuge of that mother or that dad for that matter. They run behind that that. 18-inch, two-foot-tall little child runs behind the legs of a parent believing the parent will protect me from this dog or this individual that comes in talking rough with a gravelly voice. And they hide behind the parent. And that loving parent will protect that child That's what God is to you and I. He's a loving father. We are his children. I don't care if you're 80, 90, even 100 years old listening to this broadcast. You are a child in the eyes of God. You're but a poor, small, insignificant creature in the eyes of God. So many patriarchs of faith throughout the scriptures, they they cried out to God and they pled, God, help me, God. Help me here in my crisis. Help me in my dilemma. Help me in this place of adversity. And some of you are in a very, very precarious place. The place that you are at right now is very tenuous very nebulous, very uncertain. And that's why you need God to be your refuge and your strength. You cannot get through this trial. You cannot get through this season in your life. Some of you are in a season. It's been a season of suffering. It's been a season of pain. It's been a season of disappointments. It's been a season of hurt. It's been a season of much weeping and tears. And you wonder, will my tears ever cease? Your tears regretfully may not cease, but that will not stop God from healing the wound and the hurt in your life. Emotions are powerful parts of our humanity. People talk about happiness. Happiness is really fundamentally based upon happenings. Whatever's happening makes you either sad or happy. I'm not talking about happiness. I'm talking about having peace and joy and comfort in the Holy Ghost. This is what I'm talking about. It was just some years ago When I fully understood the psalmist in Psalms 31, 15, he said, my times are in your hand. And I grasped that understanding one day that every time in David's life was in God's hand. For instance, there's a woman or or women in general There's a time of being a child playing with dolls and playing house and pretending as though they're cooking. And then they 
grow up and become a teenager, begin to date, and then they marry, and then they bear children, and they're not playing with dolls then, they're playing with their children. You see how the times have changed from playing with a doll to playing with a child? Then that child grows and matures, and that child has children, and now the mama is a grandmother. It is a different time in her life. David said, my times are in your hand. No matter where you might find yourself, it is a particular time. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 is one of the most profound discourse of time that has ever been penned or written by mortal man under the unction, under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, because it is it is so profound. Uh, Ecclesiastes 3 and 1, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. There's a season and there is a purpose. I want you to get those two words. There is a season and a time to every purpose, a season and a purpose. You may not like the season. You may not like the purpose. But there is a purpose and a season why you are where you are. Solomon said there's a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, A time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down. A time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn. And a time to dance. A time to cast away stones. A time to gather stones together. A time to embrace. And a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get. A time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence. A time to speak. A time to love. A time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also he hath set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. I know that there is no good in them, but for a man to rejoice, to do good in his life, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor It is the gift of God. I know that. Whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. That which hath been is now, and that which is to be, hath already been, 
and God requireth that which is past. A time. Right now, for many of you, this is a time wherein you need God to be a refuge, a place to flee to, a pavilion, a high tower, a high and lofty, inaccessible place where God will put you where the devil cannot get to you and touch you. Make no mistake about it. Satan is drooling to touch us. Why does he want to touch us? Why does he want to harm us so much? Why does he seek to damage and ruin our lives? Because he's a thief. He steals, he kills, he destroys, he maims, he blinds. He amputates, he destroys. He's the personification, he is the embodiment of wickedness. And he seeks to encroach your life. And I've said this in the last year, and I will say it again today. If Satan cannot get to you, Satan will work through someone very, very, very close to you. I know what I'm talking about. Satan sees your strength. He sees your loins as they are girded about with truth. He sees that shield of faith that you hold up and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And he knows he cannot conquer you. He cannot defeat you. He cannot overcome you because he sees greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So what does Satan do? He says, I will work through someone whom they dearly love, someone whom they have a great affinity, a great affection for. God is our refuge and strength. I want you to notice the phrase, a very present help in trouble. When I am present, that means I am there. You remember in school, the teacher would call roll, go through the names present or here, one of the two statements. What does that mean? I'm in the presence of the teacher. I am there. I am accountable. I am here. I have arrived. You see, God is a very present help. God is already right where you are. God didn't go anywhere when the devil came to oppose you. God didn't leave and take flight and go on vacation and abandon you. He is still right there where you are because he's a present help. It is we, regretfully, that walk away from his presence. It is we, regretfully, who get distracted, who become encumbered with the cares of this life. Luke 21, 34, Jesus said, take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your heart become overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life, so that day come upon you unawares. You need to look at yourself. Where are you right now? Are you in God's presence? Is God your refuge? Have you entered into that pavilion, that high and lofty, inaccessible place where God can put you and Satan cannot even get close to you? Or are you meandering around, waffling around, wondering? God is a place to which one can can flee to and hide themselves. We can hide ourselves and God. 
hide yourself in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And yes, maybe where you are right now is a a time to rend. It is a time when there's a tear, there's a rent in your garment, the garment of your life. The garment of your life. You see, it is emphatically beyond any man's power to alter the seasons. I cannot change this time of year. We're about to go into winter. I cannot make this season. I cannot make this season of winter spring. I can't do it. I cannot make December, January, February when it's cold and snowy and rain. I can't make it the summertime. It's beyond my power to alter the seasons. Sometimes there's a time to break down. Solomon said there's a time to build up. Maybe right now this is a time that you're broken. Maybe it is a time that things are breaking down. I'm not talking about mechanics. I'm not talking about mechanical things. I'm talking about spiritual things. It is, t- it is a time when you are spiritually broken. He came to heal the brokenhearted. He recognized there were the multitudes whose hearts were broken, whose hearts Satan had rent, he had torn, he had eviscerated. So God said, I've allowed this time for you to be broken down. You say, I don't want that. There's a time and a purpose, Solomon said, for everything. Some of you listening right now, I know in my spirit, I know by the Holy Ghost, you are not happy with this time in your life. You are not happy with this time in your life. But it's God's time. God has set this time. You say, I don't like this time. I can't help that. You can't plant green beans and corn at this time. You have to wait for that season to come that you can plant so that you might reap. There's a time to build up. Some of you right now are entering into a time. Listen to me. I'm talking spiritually. I'm not talking in the natural. This is winter time nearly. But you're entering into a time that God's going to build you up. You've been torn down. You've been broken. Now this is a time of building you up. God is infusing his word. God is infusing the Holy Ghost. God is infusing you with his divine presence. He's lifting you up. There was a time for Nehemiah to build the walls. This may be a time right now when God is building a spiritual wall around you because the enemy is going to try to come and attack you, and God already sees the future, so God is building a wall to protect you. Every one of us, at certain times, we all need to be built up in our spirit. We need to be encouraged. We need to be strengthened. We need to be edified. That's why I preach the Word of God. I want you to be edified. Like one lady said to me some time ago, she said, I don't always like what you preach. She said, but I know it is the truth. I know It is the truth. The psalmist 
said in Psalms 102 and 12, but thou, O Lord, shalt endure forever, and thy remembrance unto all generations. Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion for the time to favor her, yea, the time is come. The time is come. See, when that time comes to build you up, the devil can't stop it. God says you've been torn down, you've been broken down, you've been weeping. Psalms 30 verse 5 says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. God says, I've watched, I've witnessed your weeping. I'm going to turn your weeping into joy. I'm going to turn your sorrow into gladness. Does that take away the hurt? No. Does that take away the remembrance of that sorrowful time? No, but that's how you are able to appreciate the good times. That's how you're able to appreciate the times of blessing. I would never fully understand joy unless I fully experienced sorrow. Listen, these preachers have mixed people up. They've messed people up. They've preached so much garbage that all you're to ever experience, all you are to ever know is joy, 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 grace, 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 grace. That's not the real world. Elijah experienced great sorrow. Those of you listening to me, there are times in your life you have faced great sorrow, but because you have understood, you, you, you understand the sorrow because now you are experiencing the joy of the Lord. Nehemiah 8.10, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Had you not known the sorrow, you could not understand the joy. John 16 and 21, a woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow. Because her hour or her time is come. But as soon as the but as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. I want you to think about that statement, whether you are a woman or a man. You've been toiling, you've been laboring, you have been suffering, you're, you've been injured, you have been harmed, you have been pierced, you have been riddled, you have been perforated. This is why the child of God holds fast because just as surely as God has allowed you to be broken and torn down, God is going to lift you up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace, goodwill toward men. Praise God for Jesus Christ. Praise God for his word. David said in Psalms 119, verse 50, This is my comfort and my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me. Oh, David said, I've been afflicted, but now the word of God is comforting me. The word of God is strengthening me. The word of God is edifying me. The word of God is lifting me up. The word of God is pulling me from the miry clay and the horrible pit and setting me on a solid rock. Praise God. My time is changing. My time is changing. Your time is changing, my friend. Most of you know I don't preach like this, but all day today is I've been meditating and saying, God, give me what to say. Put it in my spirit. Put it in my heart. I don't have one note here in front of me. I, all I've got is the Bible in front of me today. Why? Because I said, God, help me to strengthen your people, unctionize me, anoint me with the Holy Ghost to touch your people and comfort them today. Psalms 119, verse 71, David said, It is good that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Because I have been afflicted, I can now appreciate the blessing of the Lord. If I never had afflictions, if 
I never had adversity, if I never had tribulation, if I never had pain, if I never had sorrow, I would never fully understand and appreciate the blessing of the Lord. God has given America a parenthetical time of reprieve. It won't last long. We may be in a third world war with North Korea. They're firing the missiles and the last missile fired just the other day. Last week, as a matter of fact, went, it flew for 50-some minutes. They know now they can reach every part of the United States of America. All they need is to figure out how to load it with nuclear weapons and the re-entry, the re-entry mechanism so it can do what they want it to do. Listen, if this, if this happens, God is saying, this is a time of war, this is a time of judgment. I don't want to speak about that. I want to stay. My time is all but gone, but I'm going to stay. God's changing your time. I, I feel this in my spirit today. God is changing the time. I, I, I'm not talking about uh, Daniel 7, 25, when the Antichrist seeks to change the times and the laws. God is changing your time because your times are in God's hand. Just as the seasons change, something is about to change in your life. If you've been faithful, change is coming. Another season is coming. In the natural, we're entering into the cold, the bitterness, the reclusiveness, staying indoors, can't get out, can't do things. Maybe God's prepping you through this message today. You might be getting ready to go into a time that God says you're going to be broken down. You're going to mourn. You're going to weep. If it is, thank God he put you on notice for it. It won't catch you unsurprised. You won't be caught off guard. God is speaking to people today. Many of you, he's speaking to you. He's speaking to you in, a, in different ways because everyone is not in the same place or time frame. No two people. The only way that two people I can perceive would be those that are married and you're going through this time together as one. God is faithful. David said in Psalms 37, 25, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down for the Lord uphold them with his hand. I have been young and now am old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. This is a particular time in your life. David says, I have been young and now am old. He's looking as he has reached a time in his life when he is old. He's reflecting. He's looking back at another time in his life when he was young. But when he takes the times in the past and he takes the time in the present and he looks from the past to the present, from the present to the past, you know what he says? I've not seen the righteous forsaken. No, his seed begging bread. Praise God Almighty. I love you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. I magnify you, Jesus. No matter where I may find my life, I thank you for your faithfulness. Some of us have suffered more than others. But God knows what you're able to endure. God knows what you're able to suffer. He knows what you can tolerate, what you cannot tolerate. He knows. God knows all about it. First Corinthians 10, 13, Paul said, There hath no temptation taken you, but such is as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you might be able to bear it. That's where you hear people say, God will never give you more than you can bear. 
God will get you through this because your times are in his hand. Your times. I cannot change the seasons. They, they, they will last. Uh, for that fact, summer, winter, spring, fall, heat and cold is going to last forever until we see a new heaven and a new earth according to the word of God. That's what the Bible tells us. Genesis 8, 22, while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. The natural seasons are engraved all the way through the millennial reign of Christ. And I can't say afterwards because John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. So I, I don't know what it will be after the thousand year millennial reign of Christ, but I know this. Your time is in God's hand. God bless you. We love you. May the words of your mouth and the meditation of your heart be acceptable unto the Lord God of Abraham because, my friend, he will embrace that. Psalms chapter 19, verse 14. Read that again. God bless you. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.